Good and good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the launch of our JRAI 2020 special issue. It's fantastic to see in the chat. We've got people connecting with us from all over the world. We've got people coming from Scotland, from Indonesia, from Stockholm, from Denmark, from Guildford. It's the whole world coming together uh, for this amazing event. And I'm very excited to be your chair today. So as many of you will know, every year we hold a competition. Uh, for a special issue of the JRAI, which is published as a supplement to our four regular issues. And this year, I'm delighted to say that the winning entry uh, was Tanya Lerman's Mind and Spirit, a Comparative Theory, fending off very strong competition, it has to be said. Uh, it's been a great pleasure for me to work with the team uh, on putting the final touches to the manuscript. And I think you're going to be very excited by the ideas and the ethnography that you're going to be introduced to today. So I don't want to talk too much about myself. I want to go straight to introducing our key guest speaker, uh, special editor uh, Tanya Lerman. Now Tanya is no stranger to UK anthropology. She completed her MPhil and PhD here in Cambridge and her first book, Persuasions of the Witch's Craft, was a fascinating study of magic and occultism and belief in the United Kingdom. She's now the Watkins Professor at Stanford, having also taught at San Diego and Chicago, and she very much retains an interest in uh, what she calls the edge of experience, whether that be in the context of uh, evangelical relationships with God, uh, or the voice hearing associated with psychosis, uh, or indeed the experiences of witches and occultists. So mind and spirit have really both been enduring concerns and interests for her across all of her work. And so it's truly wonderful to be introducing this guest edited special issue of GRAI, which brings together those themes, mind and spirit, to develop a comparative theory and really speak to very urgent concerns that we're facing in the discipline, not only about the relationship between mind and spirit, but about how we do comparison and about what kinds of methods might be appropriate for grappling with the experience and the texture of, uh, of human understandings of reality. So our special issue is up online on our website. Very excitingly, it's freely available for all of you to access until the 25th of June. So please do check it out, uh, share it with all of your friends and to uh, inspire you as to why you should and to tell you all about what it argues, please give a muted, because we're on Zoom and you're all muted, but nevertheless heartfelt and enthusiastic welcome to our guest editor, Professor Tanya Lerman. Thank you for coming. It's such a pleasure to, to share this volume with you. It represents the first major publication after a three-year a collaborative grant from the Templeton Foundation, which we've called the Mind and Spirit Project. And our core idea here has been that the way that somebody imagines the mind changes their experience of spirit, that the way that they, somebody represents their inner mental life is intimately connected to their phenomenological experience of gods and spirits. Okay, so you could say that the core idea here is that the way humans interpret their world changes their experience of the world. And anthropologists already know that. So I wanna begin by pointing out that it's not obvious that the way somebody imagines their mind matters at all. This is a 1998 paper by Angeline Lillard, who surveyed a pretty broad swath of ethnographies and anthropological fieldwork. And she argued that there were different representations of mind in different cultures and that these differences were likely consequential for human experience. She was writing about the domain called theory of mind and her, her point was that culture really mattered. Well, two well-respected psychologists responded, the cross-cultural differences cataloged by Lillard pertain only to the inessential differences rather than to the essential character of theory of mind in early acquisition. Rita Astuti, who, who uh, quotes this exchange, pointed out that they were writing as if anthropologists had folk theories of visions, while psychologists were working on the mechanism of the retina. The psychologists, they implied, did science. Anthropologists did, well, maybe more like fluff. Anthropologists know that culture matters. They know that the way that people think about thought and emotion make it makes a difference to how they live but they often know that from deep experience in one place 
we back home as a kind of implicit comparison in the background rather than, an ex rather than through an explicit point-to-point -point comparison. Our idea is that different representations of mind have more profound implications for human experience than these psychologists suggested. But we, but we also agree that anthropologists haven't systematically set out to show how this is true. Our goal in this project was to take such an effort forward and to create what we can call an anthropology of mind. Okay, so let me step back and tell you how we tried to do that in this volume. And I wanna begin with this question. Why do some people and people in some social worlds experience spirit more vividly than others, even when those others really want to? This is something I've seen throughout my work um, among witches, magicians, druids in modern London where people wanted to have vivid experiences of Demeter and Caradun and Isis among Parsi Zoroastrians in what is now Mumbai, where people wanted to experience Ahura Mazda. In charismatic, among charismatic Christians in the United States, who wanted God to talk back to them and to become their friend. More recently, in new charismatic churches in Chennai and Accra, where people also wanted vivid communications from God. They wanted to feel those, those they wanted to feel God's presence. And what I've seen is that some people just don't have those experiences. Others do, often, pretty often. So these events are important. They're at the heart of most religions. Spirits speak. That's how you know that they're there. Enkidu spoke to Gilgamesh. Yahweh spoke to Abraham. Jesus spoke to his disciples after his death. The, the angel Gabriel spoke to Muhammad. In any account of prophecy, and in most origin tales, there's a voice, there's a vision, there's a sense of presence. These experiences have mattered in history. Augustine was struggling to become a Christian, and it was because a voice spoke to him when he was in kind of an extremis, when he ran out of his house and he threw himself at the foot of a fig tree. It was because he heard God's voice that he was able to break through his resistance and commit to Christianity and change the course of the religion. Voices matter in recent history. When Martin Luther King sat at his kitchen table in the winter of 1956, terrified by the fear of what might happen to him and his family during the Montgomery bus boycott, he heard Jesus say, I will be with you. And he went forward. And voices matter to ordinary people, these experiences, these, this next quotation comes from a woman that I knew from a charismatic Christian church in California. And she went to a decent college, but the best job she could get was the morning shift in the local you know, small uh, grocery store. And this is what she said to me. One morning, this woman came in. She looked like it had, she'd been up all night. She looked like it had been rough. She threw her stuff on the counter, two packs of Miller Lite, some cat food and a food product of some sort, donuts, I think. And she looked at me and she said, hey, can you get me a carton of cigarettes? And I'm thinking, excellent. This is what I want to be doing with my life. So I turned around, rolled my eyes, and I started thinking my judgmental thoughts. In that moment, I literally heard the voice of God say to me, do not judge this woman. I have created her in my image and I love her. And poor woman, I almost fell over. I'm like trying to give her change and I'm like, whoa, the voice of God spoke to me. I have been changed ever since. I know through my prior work coming into this project that certain ways of attention, certain orientations to inner experience made these events more likely. I had found that the more that people were willing to be absorbed in inner experience, to enjoy being caught up as if in a daydream, the more they were likely to report voices, visions, a vivid sense of God's presence, and other kinds of supernatural experiences of the divine. I also had found that the more time they spent in prayer, and the kind of prayer these Christians do when they're kind of walking with Jesus and sitting in God's lap and having a conversation with God on the park bench with his arm around their shoulders, 
I found that the more time they'd spent in, t- spent in prayer, in effect, attending to and cultivating inner experience, the more they reported these vivid spiritual experiences. And so that led to the question, does the way that people think about inner experience affect these events across other cultures and religions? To begin to answer this question, I want I think we need to think about the way that humans conceptualize and attend to inner experience. I'm gonna call this an ecology of mind with respect to Gregory Bateson. And by that, I mean the way humans understand thoughts to exist in the environment of other thoughts. I wanna observe that humans are conscious and that what it is to be conscious is to have some minimal awareness of a thought-like domain and a world-like domain. We actually have a paper we've just submitted on this and and the difference between them. I'm gonna use mind to describe people's ideas about the inside, that minus, that that sort of thought-like stuff and world to describe their ideas about the outside. And sometimes people will say, that's not the way mind is represented among my people, my community. And that's the point. I want to begin with the observation of a sort of terrain of human experience, that humans are conscious, and then point out that this terrain is mapped in different ways, in different settings. So Charles Taylor, for example, has told us that modern people understand the mind is bounded, with a clear separation between the mind and world. He calls the modern self buffered. In this model, the mind is really important. It's a source of our identity. Our unique thoughts make us who we are. Thoughts are also supernaturally inert. We tend not to believe in curses and witchcraft and ordinary mind-to-mind communication, at least not in our dominant cultural understanding. You could imagine the mind otherwise, not as walled off from the world, but as, as permeable, as kind of a mesh through which thoughts could flow into the mind and other people's thoughts could flow into your own mind. Taylor talked about this as porous, and we're gonna use his, adopt his phrase to talk about porosity. And we're gonna define porosity as the idea that thoughts can leak out of the person and in effect act on their own. The idea that the mind world boundary is permeable in non-ordinary waves. The idea that people might communicate telepathically, or that sorcery works because you can place a thought inside somebody else's mind by giving them a love potion. I wanna suggest that we all have these intuitions, that you might feel uncomfortable wearing a shirt that somebody died in. You might have the passing intuition that a, a, a wish or a curse might come true, or that strong emotions after a fight might linger in a room to affect others, or that there might be some people who are able to read minds. In fact, people are constantly making judgments, I think, about how thought-like events cross the boundary between mind and world. In secular settings, what you might call our dominant culture, we behave as if wishes don't cause curses and that our thoughts are our own or that our minds are private, that when we die, all of us is dead. But in religious settings, people think differently. Prayer is an act of thought affecting the world. God speaks to people inside their minds, and the soul lives on after death. It's not just religion, though. We have lots of ideas about thoughts coming into our minds from outside or or, or, or acting on the world of their own accord. So we talk about inspiration as if the thought was not our own. It just came to us. We have the idea that that dead loved ones are looking out for us, even though we don't really believe it. We have the idea that twins can communicate with each other in times of distress. Porosity is related to religion, but it's not the same as religion. We also see that different social settings might provide the conditions in which different versions of these ideas will become culturally elaborated. So the famous example for anthropologists is witchcraft. At the center of witchcraft, is usually the idea that a malevolent thought has supernatural impact. By the idea that this core idea is instantiated in cultural practice, 
there are usually constraints. There are special people, special places, maybe special training. But what anthropologists have observed as a discipline is that this I, a concept of malevolent thought is found in some settings. So the, the idea of witchcraft, malevolent thought that hurts somebody else's body is found in some settings more often than in others. All right. So that brings us to the Mind and Spirit Project. We asked, does the way that you think about your mind affect your experience of spirit? We are a group of anthropologists, a competent in the local language where we worked. We had a senior group of anthropologists, psychologists, and the historian of religion, a philosopher of mind. This is our group. You'll hear from most of, most of them. Um, this is one of our workshops um, and a late spring afternoon. And I want, to be, I want to tell you how we asked this question by beginning to talk about how we compared. We compared our different worlds by spending time. So unlike some comparative projects, we met together, together a lot. We and, and honed our questions as shared questions that we would pursue together. We met together three or four times a week for seminars for four months before anyone did any work. We began with the questions that I had used to talk to evangelicals. And then we debated, could we ask these questions to Buddhists and Ghanaian traditionalists? How do we want to ask them? What kinds of questions would work? Should we add different kinds of questions? How should we ask the questions? Once after that period, it was only then that people went into the field. This is Felicity Aulino. And uh, here is Emily Ng heading off to her rural China site. Even in the field, we were pretty interconnected. So members, you know, different members of the group traveled to different settings. This is Joel Robbins, who was on, on, on the project in Vanuatu. Rachel Smith here is at, you know, taking the photograph. Here I am in, in China with Emily Ng underneath that extraordinary bund. A delegation of us went to, to visit uh, John Doolin and uh, Vivian Zakoto in Ghana. I'm at the, holding the camera here. And every week we spoke for at least an hour on Google Hangout. So here's the US crew in the afternoon interacting with Thailand at 6 a.m. and Ghana at midnight and China early in the morning and Vanuatu the next day. And we've continued doing that, talking about our work, trying to understand what we saw. At the core of this project is our, our intensive interviews, field work driven interviews. In each setting, we did two long, complex, semi structured phenomenological interviews, one on mind and one on spirit, both of them with deeply, deeply religious people. There were four settings that people worked in, a, a, a new charismatic uh, urban church, a rural charismatic church, an urban local uh, ind indigenous religion, a rural local indigenous religion. We came up with, the, this, is, this is an initiation that four of us on the team uh, attended together. As people talked, asked these questions, came up with the, these questions, we talked about them as we throughout the time that we were working, doing the field work and adjusted them as we moved forward. Let me just give you a feel of the kinds of questions we asked. The Our Mind interviews included a series of vignettes. So here's a, a story. We suppose that in a distant community that's very much like this one, there's a woman named Martha. One day, Martha realizes that her neighbor, Mary, is really, really angry at her, and she's been angry for a long time. And we asked people a bunch of questions about this story. We had a story, version of the story uh, focused on caring, another version focused on envy. We also asked questions directly. We asked people directly and indirectly how they thought about the imagination, about making things up, and whether and how emotions should be shared. The spiritual curiosity um, interview, the spiritual experience interview, we asked people specifically about a list of events we thought people likely experienced around the world in whatever way made sense in that local setting. We asked them about how and why they prayed or chanted and whether spirit ever communicated with them and how. 
and what their most important spiritual experience had been, using terms that each field worker thought would work best. Rich, open, complex uh, uh, interviews. People changed, again, that people would change the way they asked these questions based on our weekly interactions. It's important here that we were looking for the way people, for felt experience, not just ideas people had about these experiences, but whether they themselves had experienced it. And we went to efforts to try to figure out whether these experiences were reported by, by the individuals we were talking to. We also did something a little more unfamiliar to anthropologists. We gave our participants a scale, the absorption scale. This is a list of 34 items that people say true or false to. We translated it and back translated it. We adjusted it to local conditions. We did this because in my prior work with American evangelicals, I found that people had the way that people answered the scale was related to whether they reported vivid experiences of God. Uh, the scale seemed to pick up a personal style of orientation to inner and outer experience, a willingness to be caught up in your experience, to, to enjoy inner and outer sensory experiences for their own sake. The scale seems to pick, pick up or capture the kind of person who likes to daydream, to go for long walks in nature, to read, to dance, to write, to draw. And it seems to be associated, or at least in my work, it was associated with whether people reported these vivid experiences. So these open-ended interviews were at the heart of the work, but we did also make people do sort of, did another part of the project, which we don't talk about in the JRA, JRAI volume, but we're publishing now. And this was a side in which we, with different participants in each place, we did make people circle responses and answer specific questions. And Kara Weissman, was sort of in, in charge of trying to make sure that we collected this material, asked the right kinds of questions, collected it effectively. Nikki Ross Zender did, did an amazing job in making sure that we were, that for each interview, each interview that sort of showed up in the Stanford office represented one participant and for every participant there was one survey or, or, or other kind of piece of data. So there was a piece of this, whoops. So we did surveys with 100 undergraduates. This is John Doolin doing this work. We did surveys with 100 undergraduates in each place. We chose undergraduates to do surveys with because they, we thought they'd be familiar with pen and paper surveys because they're kind of like exams. We had RAs stand in line, like a, the equivalent of like the American Department of Motor Vehicles. They stood in line. And they asked the same kinds of questions that we did in our, in our open-ended interviews, but we demanded that give, people give a short, specific answer to that question. After we looked at all of our data, about a year after, after, after we, well, about a year after people were back, we did another round of surveys in which we tried to look carefully at what we'd seen and to see whether it really held up in this different survey with different undergraduates. So what I want to leave you with is that we kind of have some remarkable findings. No matter where you go, China, Ghana, Thailand, the United States, or Vanuatu, no matter how you ask the question, whether we ask these in this rich interview, in these short surveys, or in these short face-to-face -face interviews, the more absorption people reported, reported, the more truths they gave to that scale, the more voices, visions, spiritual experience, you know, presence of God, the more spiritual presence they reported, the more porosity they assented to, the more porosity they endorsed, the more spiritual presence they reported. So there's something that feels really resilient here, as if we've captured something that's important about, about human and cultural, humans and cultural experience. We seem to have a story to tell about a more psychological dimension of human life, there's a, that there's a personal style and attending to inner experience, being involved with your own thoughts, being caught up in your experience, that seems to affect 
um, whether you have vivid experiences of gods and spirits. And there's a story as well about what I'll call a cultural invitation. The more that people endorse ideas about thoughts having supernatural potency, either because you're vulnerable to somebody else's thoughts or because you believe that these thoughts can act in the world, the more people say yes to those ideas, the more they report these vivid spiritual experiences. And I should say that we think of porosity more as a cultural invitation, not only for two reasons. First of all, that's the way it behaves in the quantitative data, but also because on the surface, the questions that we were asking drew on cultural models about witchcraft and sorcery and miraculous healing and so forth. By their nature, these ideas seem to be more like a dimension of a cultural model that's elaborated and developed in different ways in different settings. That doesn't mean that porosity is the same everywhere. That's not what we saw. It does mean that the cultural idea that thought can be supernaturally potent is associated with more vivid, more sensory experiences of the supernatural, like voices and visions, everywhere we looked. So we see something like this. You judge your thoughts and your judgment changes the event. The more they, people think of their thoughts as being ephemeral and immaterial, as having no power, the more their experience of gods and spirits is similarly thin. Why might that be the case? Well, we think that this absorption is capturing an intense inner immersion that probably increases the vividness of experience. We think that porosity captures a kind of disinterest in the mind world boundary that might lead to a more external attribution that might allow people to represent the experience of God as more experienced, but also to as more external, but also to experience the voice of God as being more somehow vividly present in the world. So to conclude, what we've been able to show through rich anthropological comparison is that the way humans interpret their world changes their experience of their world, even when it comes to something as basic as sensory experience. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed, Tanya. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if it's possible to uh, take away that screen share as we move into the next phase of the, uh, of the webinar, uh, which is where we're going to be speaking to all of the contributors to the special issue, who's going to give us a little three minute teaser of their own contributions and their own experiences. We've had this fascinating provocation, this insight into the way that interpretation might shape sensory experience. To me, this is a very bold, important intervention into anthropological debates. We've uh, seen anthropological debates that talk about embodiment or sensory experience as being the cornerstone of social life. This suggests something that's a little bit more complicated. Uh, so I'm sure there'll be lots of questions from our attendees. And I just want to remind everyone who's tuning in, that if you do have any questions for Tanya, uh, or indeed for any of the participants as they're speaking, or for the panel as a whole, there's a little Q&A box where you can write a question. If you like a question that's already been written, you can upvote it, and we'll be engaging with your questions very shortly. So please uh, don't hold back in uh, sending them in. Uh, but for now, we turn to our next uh, phase of contribution and that's uh, from the uh, panellists and from the contributors to the special issue. And we're going to start with Felicity Aulino to tell us about her work in Thailand. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, really honoured to be here. Uh, my article offers a way of understanding the experience of converts from Buddhism to Christianity in Thailand. The article is called From Karma to Sin, A Kaleidoscopic Theory of Mind and Christian Experience in Northern Thailand. Just to give you context, less than 1% of people uh, in Thailand are Christian. Uh, Chiang Mai, where I worked, about 6% are Protestant and in the city and in the province, accounting for about a quarter of the Christians in the country. So, in dialogue with my colleagues on porosity, 
I present the mind in a dominant Thai tradition in terms of constitutive porosity. That is, rather than a stable mind that is porous with elements passing in and out, in what I call a kaleidoscopic theory of mind, the mind itself is understood as composed of component parts that continually come together in innumerable possible combinations. So whether one, for instance, encounters a spirit is contingent on a host of factors, including where you are, what you've done, what can come to constitute you at that moment. It's a karmic contingency, if you will. So conversion to Christianity then, I argue, can be understood in terms of contracted contingency, with God becoming the primary influence on experience. So this leads to, for instance, a genre of spiritual experience among Thai Christians with no real Buddhist counterpart, namely the sense of guidance. So across sites we asked, do you feel guided to act? Are thoughts that seem to guide you as if sent by God or a spirit, so forth. And Buddhists were largely nonplussed by these questions, like guided where? So read the article for a deep dive into the overlapping lists of the Abhidhamma of the Theravada Buddhist tradition that helps explain the logic of this kaleidoscopic theory of mind and the incredible detail with which lay people reflected this logic in our interviews. And thus, you know, how a local theory of mind can be a powerful tool for exploring and for utilizing philosophical lineages outside of the dominant anthropological canon. And read too for a sense of the ramifications here, particularly in terms of what I call an ontological plurality at play in non-Christian Thai contexts. That is a sense of multiple and simultaneous possibilities for reality and for experience, which is so different from what for instance, Josh Brahinsky calls the ontological anxiety that courses through interviews with Californian charismatics as they strove for consistency in their answers and proof of their encounters. It seems like a singular reality presumed. So this difference matters, not only for understanding Thai Christian experience and the stakes of conversion, but more broadly for anthropological categories and for dialogues across worlds. So thank you. All right, hi. Uh, my name is Josh Brahinsky, and I'm a research associate at Stanford right now. I've been studying charismatic evangelicals for the past 15 years. First, as the best community organizers in the world and the foot soldiers of the Christian right, and then more recently as practitioners of mind-body training mechanisms, so looking at how speaking in tongues affects the brain and the body. Um, so my piece is called Crossing the Buffer, Ontological Anxiety Among U.S. Evangelicals and an Anthropological Theory of Mind. But I want to start in this process. I've come to think of all anthropology and, and all thought as implicitly comparative. And, and that was new for me. I didn't like that when I learned that. But, um, but what's happened in this process is that we've learned some really interesting things through explicit comparison. And it's actually great that Felicity just went before me because... Um, the two big ones really are with most visible with Thailand. Uh, so I want to talk about two ideas. One is that um, there's a high intensity experience in among U.S. evangelicals that's really necessary for them to break through what they see as a buffer that bounds the inert U.S. mind. And it turns out that the buffer is really clear and really strong, but it's kind of fragile and it can just go boom, shatter. And the boom story was told again and again and again by people that I talk to. And then the other one is this worry that the secular world is constantly debunking the reality of God. And so they have to constantly say, God's real, God's real. And I'm a scientist to show you that. And this is them speaking. Um, and we call that ontological anxiety. So just two quick stories. Uh, and this first one I've heard so many times, but he's laying on the floor. It's, it's, it's a horrible moment in life. It's sort of the down, spiral homeless and dealing with drugs and uh and suddenly there's a shattering and a breaking and he says um i felt like it was a voice that pierced through all the doubt and the stuff that i had in my mind about who i was and completely shattered the wall and the voice was god and that was the transformative moment. And that was the moment that the buffer was broken and they sort of got there. And, and what's interesting is that to get to God in the United States for charismatics often requires this big break. It's much easier other places and it's much easier after you've done it with the big break. 
but but the the break or the boom or the shattering of the mind is really important. So the second, and it was especially visible in comparison with Thailand, where high arousal was not the thing that got you to God. Um, second story, uh, this guy. Um, He's a Christian. He's traveling from New Orleans to California as a Christian rap musician, very interested in music, um, totally believing in God, but, but a skeptic. And he, and he, and he tells me the story. He says, you, you're going to think I'm absolutely crazy. And he must have said that a dozen times. Um, I'm absolutely crazy, uh, but I'm a serious skeptic and I study this stuff. And so I go to this church and it's this famous evangelist and the evangelist is known for uh, people having sense, sense, they smell things in this church when he's there. Uh, so the real quick ending of this is that someone puts a baby in his arms, the baby vomits on his chest, it's a new smell, he tests the smell back and forth between the baby smell and the smell of the church. And he notices that when he shifts his intention, the smell changes. And for him, that's evidence that God is actually real and he tested it. And that's the ontological anxiety that you see in the US, but not in other places. Thanks. Hello, I'm uh, John Doolin, Assistant Professor of Anthropology, Utah Valley University. I was one of the field workers who focused on Ghana. Um, in some respects, my article adds to what other researchers have said about common Ghanaian conceptions of the relationship between mind and body. Uh, anthropologists, psychologists, linguists have noted that in Ghana, um, Many tend to emphasize the interconnections of mind and body um, and the continuity of the cognitive and the somatic. Um, my article's contribution to this body of research is unique because it explores the influence of these and other conceptions of the mind on the texture of reported experience, experiences with spirit entities. Um, I focus on a sample of charismatic Christians and a kung fu or practitioners of Southern Ghana's indigenous religion, also known locally as traditionalists. Um, I explore similarities and differences in the experience of the members of each of these communities. And I argue that there are similar patterns in the way these two very different communities describe their sense of how God and gods communicate and what that uh, experience that of, the commu of that communication is like. And that these similar patterns reflect shared assumptions about the nature of thought. Um, I found the uh, matter-of-fact sensory qualities of their experiences particularly striking. For example, one traditionalist woman described seeing an image of the gods on her wall. And it seemed so material that she called her mother in to show her this image. Um, it was also common for our uh, Ghanaian charismatic Christian um, participants to describe visions that unfold in front of their faces like an image of the future that plays out before their eyes like a movie or the descent of an angel um, in the middle of a church service. And that seems so tangible that they felt like they could just reach out and touch them. Um, participants in our project from all five regions described visions, um, including the experience of God placing an image in their mind, but our Gan Ghanaian participants talked about them as noticeably more in the world visual than many participants in some of the other regions. Um, many of our Ghanaian participants also reported audible voice experiences that they heard, quote, afar off, that they heard both with their mind and with their ears. Um, and these uh, descriptions, um, I would argue, resonate with a local theory of mind that does not draw a hard line between thoughts and sense perceptions, between cognitive and sensory um, ways of knowing. And there are other uh, other types of experiences that I talk about, uh, specifically uh, experiences that, uh, of, of God or God's pushing people to carry out certain actions in their body, um, which uh, reflects uh, a focus on, on the mind as a tool for acting in the world and also reflects this continuity between thinking and, and the body that we've talked about. And Vivian and Jacoto, I think, will talk more about um, this. So thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Vivian Jokoto, an associate professor in the Department of African American Studies at Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, Virginia. Similar to John Doolin who just spoke, I did work in Ghana on this project. Unlike John, 
I'm a psychologist by training. My contribution to the special issue explores the notion of mind in Ghana's Akan ethno-linguistic group. This was, I must confess, after a whole lot of prodding by Tanya. She kept asking me before the field work what the Ghanaian folk theory of the mind was. I kept answering, I don't know, she kept asking. Her question eventually became my question, and the field work for the Mind and Spirit Project and other information provided the answer, which is laid out in the paper. In a nutshell, what I lay out in the paper are four main things. For the Akan, one, the mind is pragmatic. Its main function is planning, which each of my interlocutors thought was so obvious that they expressed surprise at my asking the question, what, what is the mind for, what does it do? Two, the mind is valenced. People either have good minds and were therefore good people or bad minds and were therefore a threat to the well-being of others. There was no gray area here. I was intrigued to discover after working on the paper that similar perspectives about bad mind can be found in the Caribbean. Three, the mind is porous and intensely so. It is susceptible to spiritual influences, both good and evil, and I discuss these in detail in the paper. And finally, the mind is embodied, just like John just mentioned. Functions that a Western perspective might more likely locate in the mind, emotion, for example, are very much located in the body, in the account. My sources of information were Fanti ethnographic interviews, three proverbs about the mind, and an analysis of Fanti mind terms. In a variety of fields, including anthropology, quite a bit has been written about spiritual beliefs and practices in Ghana. The mind as an explicit focus, not so much. Some African philosophers, such as Professor Kwesi Riedu and the late Professor Kwame Dechi, have touched on the mind somewhat. My contribution to this special issue, titled Ajun Hwasem, An Akan Theory of Mind, builds on the foundation that they laid. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thanks, everyone, for showing up at our collective screen. Um, I'm Emily Ng. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Amsterdam. And my paper for this special issue is called The Mind and the Devil, Porosity and Discernment in Two Chinese Charismatic Style Churches. And so I also work with spirit mediums as well as Buddhists in China for the project by focus on charismatic Christianity in the paper. So while there were some interesting differences at the country level or the level of the nation state, I do touch on those. But in the piece, I try to articulate some of the differences between the urban church that I worked at in Shanghai and the rural church I worked at in Henan. And my interest arose um, in part from the quantified aspect of our interviews when China didn't really act like a self-same unit when it came to sensory experiences of spirit. And so some sites were at the highest end of the spectrum when compared to other countries and some sites were at the lowest end. And I wanted to think through how porosity might come into play in this in, in an ethnographic sense. And so in the paper, I approached the mind through a Christian practice of discernment, which was central in both churches. Discernment involves the distinguishing of whether or not something, a thought, an event, a sign was coming from God or not. And at the village church, the main difficulty people were describing in terms of discernment was the devil. The mind was seen as constantly open to the risk of corruption from the devil. So the devil could induce a sinful thought, a feeling or action or trick you into thinking something was from God when it wasn't. And in Shanghai, instead, the main obstacle to discernment was the mind itself. And so the human mind was seen as so stubbornly present that it often makes its own thoughts and desires and mistakes them for coming from God. And so in order to discern what was truly from God, one had to learn the techniques for getting around one's own mind. And I think that this paradoxical reification of the mind in Shanghai by those who repeatedly evoked it in order to sidestep it may be linked to the diminishing of sensory experiences of spiritual encounter while the strongly externalized devil that easily invades the weak boundary of the mind in Hunan may be linked to a heightening of sensory experiences. And I think of these regional distributions of porosity, partly in terms of uneven histories of secularization, 
um, rural revivals of spirit mediumship, as well as the urban rise of psychotherapy. And I also don't think that any blunt geographic distinction necessarily saturates the question of porosity. But in the case of these particular churches, um, I also think about them in terms of different rhythms of spiritual ethics. So of immediate response versus a patient gradual retrospection as marking faithfulness, um, which might merge with other logics and other habits to potentiate different sensory engagements. So to close, I think that the internal heterogeneity of China shows that the mind-spirit analytic can be useful for comparative thinking across different scales, across persons, across a lifetime, across communities, across religious traditions and nation states. And even within the borders of an intensely atheist secular nation state, people might experience mind and spirit pretty differently with porosity acting as a sort of pivot. Hello, uh, my name is Rebecca Lee. I'm a Chinese American and I'm from Beijing. Cambridge and I was the person who went to Vanuatu for this project. So for those of you who don't know, Vanuatu is a small island country in the southwest Pacific, but despite its size, it's astonishingly diverse. In fact, I think it's got the most languages for population of any country in the world. So that presented me with a puzzle in thinking about local theory of mind. And um, for the purposes of this paper, I focused on similarities um, between sites in order to try and create what Charles Taylor called a deep picture or a frame as a kind of heuristic to contrast with the North Atlantic imminent frame that Taylor constructs. Um, so I suggest that in Vanuatu, um, the tendency was uh, um, to envision a relational world, one with imbued with knowledge and meaning and intention. So for example, I found there was a strong emphasis on revelation and inspiration and signs, both in the body, um, in animal behaviors, for example, and um, interpretation of physical events as um, spiritually caused. And I call this capacity or tendency, the empowered imagination. So unlike a kind of um, secular Cartesian um, mere imagination based on un the idea of the unreal, it's really the idea that you can access a hidden reality um, through these kind of interpretations. And like Taylor, I argue that this um, requires a porous or permeable sense of self. Um, but this also exposes one to um, vulnerability to malign influences, devil, demons, different kinds of sorcery and love magic, for example. Um, and this can make the mind itself, one's own mind and one's other mind, um, more deceptive and unreliable than perhaps in the Cartesian frame. So whereas in Taylor's imminent frame, the knowledge of self is prior to the knowledge of others, and the transcendent is at the end of a long chain of inferences. I suggest in Vanuatu that the knowledge of others and, and your own minds can be more unreliable, but revealable through signs and revelation um, in the world. So whereas um, Descartes famously said, I think, therefore I am, I quote a Melanesian theologian who says, for a Melanesian, you start with I am because they are. Um, and I argue that this frame, this alternative frame provides a different sense context for experience than the one uh, Taylor describes for the North Atlantic, one that may open people to more intense and sensory uh, spiritual experiences. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Kara Wiseman and I'm a, currently a postdoctoral scholar in the anthropology department at Stanford, but I came to the project as a psychology graduate student. Um, and apparently, appropriately enough, the title of my piece for this special issue is What Anthropologists Can Learn from Psychologists and the Other Way Around. And Tanya and I co-wrote this piece in the truest sense of the word. Uh, for any given sentence at this point, um, any paragraph, there's no one clear author. And in a sense, this is an illustration of the point we make in the paper, which is that what also what we've all been remarking on throughout this webinar, our collaboration here was truly greater than the sum of its parts. Um, as a psychological scientist, I've so much um, learned so much from being immersed in a community of anthropologists. And in fact, I've come to think that adopting a more anthropological mindset using methodologies from anthropology and drawing on the cultural expertise of cultural anthropologists could go a long way toward addressing some of the most difficult issues that my field psychology is facing today. And we spend some time in the paper discussing this and we're working on a parallel piece for psychologists trying to get more of them excited about collaborating with anthropologists. 
Uh, but the bulk of this piece is about what we think anthropologists could gain from collaborating with psychologists. And in particular, we talk about a mindset prevalent in psychology that can allow us to compare cultural settings directly and learn something meaningful from this comparative effort. So we discuss how psychologists tend to focus on a specific concrete finding and apply their intense skeptical perspective to honing in on all the possible explanations of this finding. And we describe the specific methodological tools like using standard protocols, counterbalancing, randomization, thinking about convergent evidence from multiple sources that help psychologists accomplish, accomplish this and that anthropologists might enjoy adding to their toolbox. So we hope that reading this piece will shed light on why we've all come to believe so strongly in the arguments that are presented in this special issue and inspire some of you to collaborate with um, across fields, especially anthropology and psychology to explore more of these deep questions that interest both fields. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you so much, Cara, and to all of our contributors for your fabulous talks. And I think one of the points that really comes through from Cara's contribution is that the interventions made by this collection are not just theoretical, as we've heard, they're not just ethnographic, as we've heard in the various um, case study tasters, but they're also methodological. So there's lots of stuff that readers can gain from engaging with the special issue. Uh, just to remind you, it is freely available until the 25th of June, uh, and also so lots of points that can be discussed in the Q&A right now. Now we've had some great questions coming in. Our most popular question comes from Jamie Barnes. Hello Jamie. That's a question very similar to the one that I was thinking of asking myself. So we're going to start with that. And Jamie asks, why make mind the starting point for comparison and not a category like body or person or self? And I guess one of the um, things I would add to Jamie's question is how confident you might feel, Tanya, that the category of mind or the category of thought is something that exists all across the world. I mean, might there be some contexts where that wouldn't be quite the right, the right term, um, whereas body or person might be, might be more robust? How confident are you that this uh, framework that you're developing could extend beyond the societies studied? Well, that's a great question and the deep question. And I can tell you that we as a group talked about this often quite vehemently for hours as we sort of, as we approached the work, how do you compare mind? So let me just begin by saying that one reason to even start with mind is that it's not well worked anthropological territory, the way body, person and self is. I'm also deeply interested in these intense and unusual experiences, spiritual experiences, and I, I just think that they had that there is a story to tell about the way they're connected to the way people judge thought-like events, which is a story about mind. But the big question: How confident are we that there that all humans have minds? Let me put that around, turn that around and say, what would you think of the claim that some group of people didn't have minds, weren't conscious? That would seem like a claim that they weren't even human. So I think, you know, so, that, that, so I think that the way we just talked about this as a group is that there's some, some kind of terrain of human experience. Maybe we never see that terrain directly, but we, uh, commit to the view that humans are aware what it is to be human is to be aware to be able to 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 be able to think to know that you are thinking we haven't seen reports of humans that aren't don't do that and if you start with that then you start with some kind of sense that there is something like a mind like thing and a body like thing and in fact one of Kara's main projects with this with, with this group has been to, um, I should actually have Kara pop in and describe the paper that we're just about to submit, or maybe has been submitted already, where we find something like an, an idea about mind and body in, uh, in each of these, these cultures, looking with very different methods. But I think, I think you begin with the terrain of human experience, and then you talk about the mapping of it. But let me turn it over to Kara for, for a moment. Sure, this is a, a glimpse of the more um, 
psychological quantitative side of this project far beyond what happens in the special issue. But um, one of the things we did to try to uh, have a different kind of approach toward this question of what are the uh, what are the parts of the self or mind or body or person that people are working with in each of these contexts is to adopt this kind of uh, psychological paradigm that I've used in my work um, where we ask people questions like, that sound a little crazy, things like, can chickens feel love or um, do beetles feel guilty or get hungry or uh, remember things? And we see how people's answers to these questions might shed light on the different clusters of capacities or abilities or experiences that they see as being um, part of the sort of philosophy of mind or philosophy of person in, in their context. And through that kind of approach, we have seen some evidence that in these five sites, um, adults and actually children too, do seem to make a distinction between the more embodied parts of experience like hunger and pain and the more cognitive parts of experience like memory and thinking. That's some little drop of evidence and a big bucket of question and um, you know, uncertainty that in these sites, people are making some distinction between cognition and mind and body, uh, but that has to be tempered by the cultural expertise and ethnographic evidence that um, the rest of the panelists here have to bring on, on, any, on these sites and on any other site, I would say. Great, thank you so much. <clears throat> Let's now move on to a question from Rosie Jones McVeigh. Hello, Rosie, thank you for joining us. Uh, Rosie asks what I think is a very interesting question because she says, do you see any mileage for this line of research teaching us anything about interpersonal dynamics, empathy and human capacities to connect with or make sense of one another rather than with spirits or the, or the supernatural? Do different representations of mind lead to different experiences of human company as well? Very interesting question. What do you think? I, I think so. I mean, I think that there's this, the, the question, you know, whether you model minds as being sort of very different and very, very separated, um, can in fact uh, lead people to think differently about their responsibilities to other people. So if you think about, say, humans as being more enmeshed with each other um, and the, the minds as more, being more, well, if you think that somebody else is able to... Um, kind of hurt you by thinking about you, you might think differently about sharing your own experience with that person. That might have a big impact on the way in which you thought about sharing your, your feelings and, and, and your emotions. It might have an impact on, um, on whether you, how readily you trusted another person. If you think of your mind as being very separated from the world, maybe you feel that you need to be less empathic. I think it was Rousseau who, said, who thought that language gave, that, that if that language enabled a man who heard somebody screaming under his window, understand that person as being different from him and therefore the pain was not his own. Very, very interesting. It feels like it's a point that invites an ethnographic so I wonder if any of the contributors found these dynamics playing out in their field site. There was any way in which ideas about mind were feeding into particular aspects of human company and interrelations. Don't want to put anyone immediately on the spot, but Rachel, you're volunteering. Maybe you can share how this played out in Vanuatu. Uh, well, in my paper, I do try and deal with a bit of a puzzle in that in the, the Pacific literature, for those uh, familiar with that, um, there's a lot of literature that points to, for example, Joel Robbins on the Arapman that points to this idea that other people's minds are unknowable. Um, but the other uh, end, we've got people like Marilyn Strathern, who famously talk about how deeply relational uh, Melanesian people are. 
and how they're partable and, and sharing substance with each other. And I did tend to find in Vanuatu that people often discuss relationality in less mental ways than say a psychological theory of mind and much more embodied ways. So it might help us actually unpack what, what we mean by um, empathy and think about the different ways in which, for example, I mean, some of it is inseparable from religion. Some of the Christian healers, for example, talked about literally feeling the pain of others in their body, even when the sick person hadn't told them of their sickness and was at a distance that they sensed in their body. And whereas the non-Christian, the traditionalist, there were what we call custom villages, would talk about um, sensations in their body, predicting if someone had a baby, if they were coming to visit, etc. So it might, um, and that's something we're exploring still as a team of different dimensions of empathy and caring, as well as uh, mental inference, also emotional um, inference as well. Fantastic. Thank you, Rachel. And I, mean, I think this just reveals how important this work is, because it's not only affecting spiritual experience, but it's feeding into the very stuff of sociality and social interaction, which is the bread and butter of any anthropological research. So thinking about these ideas of porosity and uh, understandings of mind seems to be absolutely crucial. And that leads very nicely into the question that Marie-Sophie Mousselier has asked. So hello, Marie-Sophie. Thank you so much for your question. Uh, Marie-Sophie, has asked, are there cultures, uh, or we might think of <coughs> subcultures or groups or societies that allow more absorption and porosity than others? But crucially, do you know why? And what might be some of the broader historical, political, other factors that lead to these kinds of differentiations? I think that's a really, really important question to address. I wonder who would like to share their thoughts. Emily, because you were doing a direct comparison um, between rural and urban settings, maybe that you could share some initial thoughts to begin with. Yeah, I think, I think there are so many different elements and factors that come to play. And I think, you know, a lot of it, obviously, is, as we all know, is the story of secularization. But I think that as we compare stories across um, our sites, there's also different kind of... Um, crossings of what might invite or induce a kind of um, openness to spiritual experience. So let's, for instance, in China, I think that um, there are really uneven kind of effects of the secularization and anti-superstition campaigns that have occurred over the last century plus that have discouraged particular forms of engagement and encouraged other ones with, um, with the return of religion after the end of Maoism. And so the story is much more complicated than that, but in these particular cases that I was working with, for instance, charismatic Christianity really re-encourage a direct engagement with personified spirits of particular sorts. And so God and the devil as particular persona. And in the urban site, for instance, the devil was diminished as a character and where, um, that is involved in one's life. And at the same time, when I work with Buddhist and spirit mediums, the contemporary Buddhists in Shanghai who are doing a lot of cultivation working for hours to, um, uh, to work toward karmic um, uh, gathering, they were discouraging themselves from engaging spirit as uh, personified. And so this came with the modernization of Buddhism, which had a specific effect. And the quote unquote popular Buddha Taoist traditions um, that influence spirit mediumship instead take up the same implicit corpus of, um, of, uh, of philosophies and literatures, but emphasize embodied portions. So in fact, people um, in the rural sites, spirit mediums are engaging with bodhisattvas and Buddhas as spirit rather than as um, a more abstract sense of presence. I don't know if that answers it, but I think that there, is, there are a lot of questions of how these um, threads move, not just not just in terms of culture as a set domain, but in terms of the crossing of culture, history, and religious traditions across time. Great. Thank you. Anyone else like to add any further insights on that question? Tell yeah, me. let me pop in. I mean, I think that this is one of the important next steps. I mean, these are fabulous questions. These are all questions that the, pro the project should pursue over time. 
But one of, um, so we, we start with the idea that humans have these intuitions about the way thoughts can be kind of understood um, and that different cultures will find some of these um, in, intuitions useful and they'll develop and elaborate them. And again, I think the, the um, question for me is when, under what social conditions is the intuition that a thought can harm somebody else? Under what social conditions is that useful? Um, under, I think one of the things we've been trying to ask, and we have, don't know the answer yet, is whether harm is more salient to people, the th thoughts that are harmful are more salient than thoughts that are helpful. Mm -hmm. And I think we lean a little bit towards the observation that cultures are more likely to pick up and elaborate the question of whether thoughts can be harmful. And again, that's where the witchcraft story becomes salient because witchcraft is an example of, you know, people, people feel vulnerable and certain when the community is settled and when people can't move. That's why the anthropologists argue that you found these elaborated ideas about witchcraft in, um, small face-to-face -face agricultural societies where people couldn't move. Um, and we're trying to, to take that forward, um, but that's the way in which I would, I, I, I would take, I, I would develop it. Great, thank you very much. So we've got a very popular question from Matt French and it's a great question. So hi Matt, thank you for your question. Uh, so Matt is kind of zooming out a little bit and trying to think about how this special issue fits within the broader theoretical landscape and intellectual landscape of anthropology. And Matt asks, would it be too simplistic to make a comparison between Mind and Spirit Project and the Sapir Whorf language thesis? namely how we speak structures how we perceive our environment. Does how we think about mind operate in a similar fashion? Um, what would you say to that? I'm happy to pop in, but I, Kara. I'd love to hear what you have to say, Tanya. I mean, one thing that uh, I see the similarity there. It's not, uh, I do see that parallel. One thing that I'll mention is that our theoretical perspective is that these um, beliefs or intuitions about porosity and about minds are, uh, m might be the kinds of things that give rise to different forms of language, for example, rather than the words people using giving rise to the beliefs. Um, so the directionality of influence there, I think, is is the reverse. But the intuition that um, the, the way we think and talk about things influences the way we experience them. I think that there's a deep parallel there with other work. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think that, what, and I think what we're trying to do is to understand um, the ways in which these conceptual representations kind of interact with the, the social world. Um, but this is the kind of key anthropological observation that representations, understandings arise from a social context and deeply shape the way that people interact with that context. And cognitive representations, cultural models, ideas that people have are like language in that respect. Great, thank you so much. Now also kind of interrogating and um, hoping to develop or clarify your conceptual framework is a question from Andy Lee. Uh, thank you for joining us, Andy. And Andy says that uh, he'd like to hear more about the category of faith, uh, faith or the reality of religious faith, because that's not come through so much in the, the presentations, obviously the time's only been, uh, been, been limited. So how does faith assuming that it's a relevant category, relate to mind and spirit in these cases. In other, ways, in other words, we might say, if you've got these representations, might something about your faith in those representations or your faith in certain experiences feed into um, the dynamics that are being discussed? Felicity? 
Oh, well, this is just a great question. And it, it just opens up a whole um, line of thinking and questioning. I think from the Thai context, what I've come to start considering is how belief and how faith, which are so crucial to um, core constructs in Western psychological models, are displaced in the kaleidoscopic theory of mind as um, not only just one component part that could open things up, but maybe not even characterized as such uh, in in the philosophical lineages. So I think that there's something to be explored here about how people understand that faith can open up to very, to even allowing sensory perceptions. And in the Thai context, not necessarily whether or not it's proof of what's real, it's what you could access at that moment. And so the simultaneity of having for instance, let me tell the story of talking with this monk at one point. I was asking him this question, not so much with faith, but more with belief, but similar. Um, and he was talking about if there was a ghost present and someone believed that there could be a spirit there. One person who believes it then might see it. And another person who doesn't believe it might not see it. But it's not there. But it is. But it's not. But it is. But it's not. It's So what I'm trying to do in this kind of... Um, flippant way is to bring our attention to how faith is operating here and how what faith captures, whether it can bring you to a reality or uh, an, a construction, is not necessarily the heart of the matter for uh, faith. Josh, please keep going. Well, I was just going to say the opposite story, which I think is just useful to understand where faith and belief are things that are actually really difficult to reconcile for the folks in the United States, partly because it would drive them nuts, the idea that it could be there and not be there. So it's absolutely either got to be there or not be there. And so having faith, at least for the charismatic evangelicals that I talk to, is really very difficult. And, the, and they want to, and they, they struggle to, and they do all sorts of work on themselves to get themselves to have faith. But it's constantly with this question of like, do they believe? Do they believe? And belief is different than faith, right? Belief is a clarity in their mind. And they, so, so that's part of what's interesting in the U.S. is that faith and belief are actually different processes. And they're both sort of struggling with this uncertainty and the secular voice in their heads that's constantly saying, is this actually real? And you have in the sense that you could, and you would cultivate a kind of intention to believe. And in uh, thinking karmically, there might be an understanding that you may strive, but it's not totally up to you. Uh, so intention is decentered again in some, in some theories of mind. Great. While we're on this kind of topic that Josh was talking about, about the kind of uncertainty and the ontological anxiety. We've had a couple of questions come in specifically about ontological anxiety. So it might be good to drill a little bit deeper into that if, you, uh, if you're keen to answer, Joshua. So we've had one question from Salvador Loret, uh, who asks, is there a correlation in levels of ontological anxiety and cultures that have focused on individuation and the importance of self as opposed to those where group and community mindset is more prevalent, uh, as ego death and subsuming the self for the greater good runs against the societal framework in which we, this being kind of Western, Western individual subject, uh, in which we live. Do you think that's the, do you think it's individuation and the importance of self that is integral to generating ontological anxiety, or might you view other factors as being also relevant or maybe, maybe more relevant? That's a huge speculation and a really interesting one and really difficult to answer. I can give one itsy bitsy little piece that would add to it, but I don't think I can answer it. So since we've done this, done this bigger study altogether, Tanya and myself and a neuroscientist have been working with um, very closely with U.S. evangelicals speaking in tongues and trying to uh, and having them in MRIs while they're speaking in tongues and having them do really intensive interviews while they're uh, about their tongues experience. And the question, one of the questions we've tried to ask is, do you have a sense of ego dissolution when you are speaking in tongues? And they hate this question. Um, they find it 
I, I, I've had people say, literally, I hate that question. <laughs> not just, uh, so I'm not just speculating that they hate the question, but um, because in charismatic evangelical culture in the United States, there's a real intense attachment to being an individual, making choices, being in a complementary relationship with God, and not giving up yourself fully. Like they're always like, we're always choosing, we're always choosing, we're always choosing. Um, and that may not be true everywhere in the US and, and that may not be, we don't know enough to know if that's really different because we haven't done this all around the world and done that actual com comparison in these different sites. So this is a very, very beginning sort of little piece of the pieces that, of the small group of people that we've talked to. Um, but if that gives you anything about individual, Indiv the relationship between individualization and or individualism and ontological ontological anxiety then um, please take it but take it as small <laughs> so let me j jump I mean I think that's excellent and really really important I, I just wanted to say something simple which is that if faith is hard one of one of the reasons that spiritual experience matters is that it God feels more real to people and more present um, when he feels present. Faith, you, you know, and, and so it, when, you, when you live in a world uh, in which, you know, what, what, buffer, what, what Charles Taylor calls a buffer, with a buffered self, with a bounded mind, it's harder to feel the presence of gods and spirits. So that's what we saw in, in our work. And that makes it more difficult makes it more difficult to kind of hang on to the nearness and the closeness and the everyday presence of these beings. So I, I think that does create more ontological anxiety. And that's what the ontological anxiety is about. Great. Maybe just as a quick follow-up to that, we've got a follow-up question from Patrick McKinney. Hello, Patrick, uh, who asks, does this research offer us a new way to articulate contrasts that anthropologists often make between Euro-American individuals and more relational others outside of the West? Or does it challenge that story? And does it in any way uh, challenge our picture, he says in particular, of who Euro-Americans are? Vivian or John, do you want to go for that? I did see Felicity's hand up, so maybe Felicity can step in and tell. You know, one thing I would love to just mention is that we're really trying to get at experiences and try to describe with some nuance how people articulate and uh, things that maybe they have never tried to articulate. We're trying to get a grasp on phenomenological experience. And so in some ways, much literature has made grand proclamations or tried to lay out things. And although it may sound like we're doing that, and we do in some ways, um, there is a sense through this and through our work with people of trying to um, understand what they felt. You know, and Tanya's um, approached us and the original interview guide was like from her work where she would ask someone, did you, you heard the voice of God did you turn like as if you heard it outside of your head? Was it far or near at this level of what individuation feels like? At what communication with otherwise unseen others feels like is what we're in large part after. And I do think that adds something different to a lot of work on the topic. And so, and just, just to follow up, I think that that was, very well, well, well said. You know, I think we understand a lot about the word individualism. We use it a lot, and we don't really fully understand it, but it, it captures something that we all think that we mean. We, we all, you know, we're comfortable with the word. I think minds are invisible to us. The idea, you know, who thinks about the texture of your thought? But it's something that's really powerful to human experience. And when you pay attention, you realize that sometimes you have spontaneous thoughts and sometimes you have loud thoughts and sometimes you have a background chatter and everybody's different. 
people talk, some people feel they have a running monologue all the time and some people don't. You sit at, a, at the table and you say, what, what's, going on, what, what's going on with your mind? And what's, what are you thinking about? And sometimes people verbal and sometimes they look at you blankly. And we, it's really, I mean, it's the water in which we swim. So to be able to say there's something that's culturally shaped is that the, the water is kind of culturally tinted kind of really matters. It gives you a new perspective to think about what's kind of fundamental to the sense of what it is to be alive. And that's what we're trying to do. Rachel, did you want to jump in here? Sorry, just to be really brief, I think one another, I think there's definitely, I think our research points to there being something in that story of the Western individual Cartesian, that there is some salience in that and that's why it's been reproduced. But I think one of the unique things about our project is we're not just doing that implicit comparing an us, which is usually the West, to the other, but we're actually comparing across all these different sites. And I mean, I think Emily's research is the most like kind of salient example of this where, I mean, often China has been seen as the relational versus the Western, et cetera. And Emily's research really shows the not only the variation within China, but you know, that, that the psychologized sense of self is quite salient in parts of China, whereas in other parts it's quite different. But I can also see parts of China that are similar to Vanuatu and parts are very different. So. Great, thank you. Now we've been talking a lot about thought and mind, but we've been talking a lot about conscious thought. And Laura Meek asks a really great question about the unconscious, I guess, um, because Laura, hello Laura, thanks for joining us, uh, asks, did you find that differences in porosity or absorption were related to different experiences of dreaming or to different understandings of what dreams are and what they can do? So how might bringing dreams into the picture uh, enrich our understanding of mind and spirit. This is a question for Vivian and John. And the other, the other thing that really happens, or the most amazing thing about Ghana is not only dreams, which are also like really vivid in, in Vanuatu and they're vivid elsewhere, but sleep. There's something really cool, weird, and wonderful about sleep in Ghana that I think you guys should talk about. I'll go, I'll go first. Um, one thing that we, we noticed uh, during the interviews was that uh, we would ask maybe like about, about a vision um, or about someone's experience with, with God and they'll start to describe something that happened to them. And it will sound like something that they experienced in their kind of waking consciousness. And later on, what we find out is actually they're talking about a dream that oftentimes the the line between the dream world and the real world would seem blurred in the way these experiences were talked about. And, and I think this does reflect a, a specific conception of the mind because um, in the world that, in, in, the, in the world of uh, say psychology in North America, the dream is mind stuff, it's localized, right? Um, and in these interviews, oftentimes the dream seemed very clearly to be assumed to be world stuff. It's something that is connecting them with something uh, kind of real um, out there. Um, so that's how I would answer that question. Um, I'm curious to hear what Vivian has to say. So <clears throat> Ghana was one of the most porous um, countries in in the work that we did. And as part of the interviews that we did, we spent some time talking to traditional healers. Uh, those would not necessarily be, they would absolutely not be representative of the entire country because they're a small group, but they also tended to have extremely porous experiences because they would get possessed by gods, um, you know, during the day uh, that was part of their divination process and so on and dreaming was a very important part of their practice and so people would get answers on how to treat patients in dreams um people there were, there were actually very specific sleep practices related to traditional healers um 
people that they lived with were not supposed to wake them up. They had to wake them up in a particular way because it was thought that they communicated a lot to the gods in dreams. Uh, as far as Christians go, dreams was also a space, as John talked about, where um, God communicated with people. And the, there was also something about the night. And the, there was an assumption that there were certain times of night that were very spiritually powerful. And so people would interrupt their sleep to pray during these times of night, because that was when sort of the, the connection would be strongest. Um, but also, you and then go back to sleep, but also God could communicate through dreams. So dreaming was actually very important, a, a very important part of um, the Ghanaian religious experience. Great, thank you. I just want to give a quick shout out to Cecilia Montero, who also uh, asked a question about dreams, but it got buried a little bit low down in the list of questions. So um, also answered by those great, great comments. Uh, we've got a question from Megan Rose Donnelly. Hello, Megan Rose, uh, who thanks everyone for the rich and thoughtful presentation and wants to ask about the internal diversity that you encountered in each of your field sites. So Megan Rose asks, did you ever encounter local theories that different kinds of people had different kinds of mind? Uh, and did any of the people that you worked with develop theories similar to what you've presented with us today, namely that cultural ideas about the nature of thought can influence people's experience of spirits? So she gives the example, do Christians think Buddhists think differently and therefore have different experiences? Do charismatic Christians think their minds have been restructured post breakthrough? Vivian. So I can give one example related to good mind, bad mind. Pretty much all the people that I talked to in Ghana assumed that there was an element of good mind and bad mind. However, the, in, the difference came in uh, when I talked to rural people versus urban people. So some of the rural people thought that bad minds were pretty prevalent. And I started asking people to estimate, you know, in, in 10 people, how many, how many bad people are out there. And what was interesting to me was that the urban numbers in terms of bad people were smaller than the rural numbers of bad people. So bad pe uh, so rural people thought that the world was a much more dangerous space than urban people did. John. Yeah. Um, so there is absolutely internal diversity in these regions. And I think one of the, the benefits of the quantitative component is that we really can get a clear picture of what that diversity looks like. Um, just one, one anecdote, even among our research team, I had a, one of our um, research assistants read some work by Catherine Geertz on Iwe conceptions of, of mind and body. And he was just like, it's like a, a light went off of his head. He's like, this is absolutely how Ghanaians like understand the mind and body. And he's like, I'd never do anything without thinking about it. The mind and body are just so like uh, interconnected. And, and he was talking to the other research assistant about it. And she's like, she's like, no, I don't think so at all. I don't think about everything that I do with my body. I don't. And they are having this debate about whether Catherine Gertz is properly representing um, the, the Ghanaian conception of mind and body. And so, yeah, there is, there is diversity. One of them had a PhD and one of them had a bachelor's degree. That may be part of it, but um, our project does uh, get at that diversity as well as salient patterns. Yeah, and very interesting to think how that kind of diversity might itself generate certain kinds of social divides or complicated relations. Tanya, would you like to speak to this question further? Yeah, after we finished the, the, you know, the formal collection of you know, these are our sites, um, Josh and, and uh, the, our young neuroscientist, Michael Lifshitz, and, uh, and, and Nikki went down to Esalen. And Esalen is this glorious pl place by, by, this, by Big Sur, it's where the 60s happened and still go on. It's kind of just beautiful and extraordinary. And it's a, the heart and, the, and it's in some sense the heart, heart of the new age or one of the many beating hearts of the new age. And so, and we did these interviews with about 20 people at Esalen. And I, so I had come into this project, I'd done some version of our spiritual experiences, spiritual curiosity interview with a lot of people. 
but we made up our mind interview together. And I had never done it myself um, with, apart from the efforts to, you know, let's, you know, to, to kind of pilot it early in this project. So there we were in Gloria Cecilin interviewing people who I kind of had thought would embrace very similar understandings of the world about a kind of universal mind and, you know, sort of vibrations and energy and all this, all the rest of it. And um, 20 people. And, and I was kind of face to face with something like eight of them. And I was really impressed because on the first of all, when I talked to people about the mind in this mind interview, people said really, really different things. Some people absolutely were thinking about a world that was kind of really interconnected and they, they had a very, very porous mind. And other people had this kind of Charles Taylor bounded, bounded self and they weren't having any of this kind of ridiculous connection with the universe stuff, even though they, they had some, some language to go along with that. I wasn't sure how much they talked with each other, but they had very different models. And the other thing that was stunning to me is that when I talked to people about the mind, and I talked to people about spiritual experience, there was this direct relationship, which until that point, I mean, I'd seen it in our data, but it was sort of stunning to drive down to Esalen and to sit with somebody. And if somebody said, oh, Martha and Mary, Mary can't do anything to Martha. What are you talking about? And then I would say, tell me about your experience of ghosts and gods. And ah, and they just didn't have that kind of thing. And if somebody, and if somebody said, you've got to really be careful. So it, it's, it is possible. I know people don't think this, but if, if Mary's anger, Mary's anger can really do something to Martha, then, you know, we'd get to the other interview, maybe the next day, and they all sorts of kind of intense experiences that they reported all these, these amazing experiences. So um, anyway. Great. Thank you so much. Um, we're <clears throat> running short on time, so I know there are others who'd like to, to contribute to that question, but I think we need to move to this very important question, which comes in from Liedem Lefferts, who asks, did you find that mind can be gendered? And of course, we've not really um, explored the theme of gender in relation to mind and spirit uh, that explicitly. Is it important to bear gender in mind when we're discussing these dynamics? Yes, but I think Kara, Kara, do you want to speak to that? I, I can say something. It's, um, let me begin by saying that we do know that women say yes to the absorption score scale more than men, um, a little bit higher, just kind of, you know, a couple of points, but it's kind of a significant percentage. Um, what do we know about gender in other ways? Kara, do you, do you want to, do you have something to say about that? I wish I had something interesting to say about that, but I don't. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, it's something, you know, I, I think I'm really grateful for the question. I'm curious to go look at our data sets um, on the quantitative side and see if we might see hints of things to follow up on in, in further research. But off the top of my head, I, I have no idea how gender influenced um, people's responses in our, in our measures. Um, I'd be curious about what other people's intuitions are too. Well, perhaps it feeds back into um, the final question I'm going to pose to you because we are- Rachel had an answer. Rachel wanted to say Rachel, something. Yes, graphically, I think it's something we should definitely explore with the data we have, because we do have the genders of the participants. But ethnographically, I think, certainly in Vanuatu, people often have their own gendered um, explanations. And for example, in the Christian context, it was very much the heart in which you were porous to God. And like in Vanuatu, they talked about women being much more soft hearted, much more open, men being much more hard hearted, which would fit with this tendency maybe for, for women to be um, more absorptive. But I think there's obviously a lot of cultural explanations that might vary in different religious and cultural contexts too, of terms of who can be certain prophets or religious specialists. But certainly in Vanuatu, that was their explanation. Um, 
for um, why even though the leadership was mostly men, a lot of the sort of spiritually talented healers and prophets were, uh, and song receivers and things like that were, were women. They talked about this softness of the women, um, which speaks to a kind of permeability for sure. Great. Well, we, I think we only have time, sadly, for, for one more question. What I'm going to do is take two questions and kind of uh, bundle them together. I know there are lots of other really fantastic and often quite detailed and specific questions that people have been asking, and we will pass those on uh, to the contributors. Um, but for now, I want to return to this question of the body, which we touched on a little bit earlier. We were saying, well, why start with the mind rather than the body? Uh, but we've got two questions from Justine McCabe and Robert Serple that interrogate the relationship between mind and body. Uh, so Robert asks, how does the notion of porosity relate to Lakoff and Johnson's theme in their book, Metaphors We Live By, that the body provides structure to the metaphorical dimensions of thought? And Justine asks, can you speak to a differential porosity of belief in unity of mind and body versus mind and world in the cultures studied? So I wonder if there are any closing thoughts on how bodies feed into this debate and of course I mean, gender becomes very relevant to that because although gender is not wholly to do with the body embodiment is often central to gendered experience well i think you can't think about body without mind it is part of the experience of body mind is awareness of body and so for sure the idea that uh, metaphors of human experience come from the body, that is also a story about mind. It's a story about how people are aware of, of their body. And, it, and, it, and, it's, and I'm going to turn it over to Kara um, to say more about that. Well, I just wanted to chime in. I didn't mean to interrupt you, Tanya, um, but I wanted to chime in with a couple of memories of our time together, which I think are kind of a nice image to end on because this question of, mind, body, what is porosity, what are, what are we porous to and who's the we, um, you know, are we the mind and the body, we're porous to the body, are we the body and we're porous to the world. These were the subjects of numerous of the uh, long conversations and I have these images of Josh at the whiteboard drawing concentric circles and here's the mind and here's the society and here's the nuclear family and here's the broader community and here's the body and here's the spirit and we were just sort of all taken with this question and I think um, there was an intuition that people in these five different sites would answer this kind of question quite differently. And we started thinking about um, what are the sort of, could you come up with some grid of dimensions of porosity where you can locate rural China here, 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 and here, but you know, the rural US might be similar in these dimensions and different on these dimensions. This is just a flavor of the kind of um, details and depth that we would get into in these conversations. This question of mind, body, porosity, world um, was by far the sort of deepest, most confounding and most energized uh, kind of conversation that we had in my memory anyway. Uh, so I wanna just honor that as a, it's a really deep question that we continue to grapple with. Vivian, I'll turn to you for the last word. Um, I was just going to say that we actually might be able to answer pieces of that question using the quantitative data. Not all of it, but we do have pieces of body awareness in the quantitative data and porosity measures. Um, so if we find some ways of looking at specific mind measures, this is something that we could look at correlations of. So, but right now we, we don't know what, what that will look like. Yeah, fantastic. And of course, it's important to remind everyone who's joining us from home that this is an ongoing research project. There's still lots to be done. And so thank you, everyone who's sending questions that can help inspire and drive forward that research agenda. Uh, thank you to all of the contributors to the special issue uh, for sharing your ethnographic stories, uh, your conceptual insights. I think what we've seen here is not just a kind of glimpse into the different forms of spiritual experience that people might have across the world, and not just uh, very exciting and important comparative theory about the relationship between uh, representations of mind 
and spiritual experience, but also something that's really raised very deep, very important questions about the, the fundamental building blocks of anthropological analysis, where we start from how we think about the relationship between thought and interpretation and embodiment and the senses. And it's going to be a lot of food for thought for all of our viewers, I'm, I'm sure. So just to remind everybody, if you would like to read Mind and Spirit, A Comparative Theory, you can go to the JRAI website and you'll be able to read the entire special issue fully open access for free until the 25th of June. Uh, so do that, share it on social media, share it with your friends, share it with your students, share it with your peers if you are a student, share it with your professors if you're a student, uh, and let's get this part of the uh, global anthropological debate. Uh, so I've been Nick Long, it's been a pleasure to chair you all. Uh, thank you so much to the Royal Anthropological Institute, to Hanine and Emma for hosting, and we wish you all uh, the very best for is a Friday evening here, a Friday morning perhaps elsewhere, uh, but certainly for a weekend uh, which is to come. Thank you very much and have a great uh, have a great weekend.